Hi, I'm John McElroy, and welcome to today's presentation on intercorporate dividends. We're going to take a look at Section 55.2 of the Income Tax Act. As some of you might be aware, April 2015 budget brought a lot of changes. And intercorporate dividends are a big part of a lot of corporate structures, even for relatively small and modest owner managers. So this is something that really can impact the way we do business. So I get a lot of questions about this from clients. I thought I'd make this short video and see if I couldn't explain it in more detail so I could refer them to the video for a little more detailed uh, explanation of what the changes are. What is Section 55-2? I mean, simply put, it's an anti-avoidance rule. Let's see how it works. You're an owner-manager and you have a hold co. Your hold co owns shares in an operating company. Let's say that opco has a fair market value of $1,000. Let's say the ACB is 100 bucks. You want to sell OPCO, along comes a buyer, buys the shares. What are the tax consequences? Well, if you sell it for what it's worth, the proceeds of disposition are 1,000, your ACB was 100, that gives you a capital gain of 900 bucks. But is there a way possibly to avoid the capital gain? What if, for example, the OPCO first paid a dividend of $900 up to the hold co? Why do that? Well, it's tax-free in many cases to flow dividends from one company to the other, at least it used to be. And then after the tax dividend is paid, the fair market value of the OPCO is going to be reduced by $900 down to $100. And since the ACB is also $100, your capital gain is going to be zero. That is an example of capital gain stripping. And in 1980, an anti-avoidance provision was written into the Income Tax Act basically to shut down capital gain stripping. And that anti-avoidance provision is Section 55 of the Income Tax Act. It's a pretty important part of the Act. Uh, it's very complicated. At least it was. Now it's even more complicated. I'm going to give you a simple overview of what the, what the section looks like. 55.1 are the definitions. 55.2 uh, outlines the negative consequences, i.e. what happens if your transaction or series of transactions should fall under this provision. 55.2.1 tells you the preconditions that exist that are going to cast you into the net of 55.2. What has to happen for 55.2 to apply? 55.2.3 and 2.4 are about uh, stock dividends and things like that. I'm not going to touch on them. 55.3 covers some exceptions, they are important. There's been big changes in that area as well. So in a nutshell, Section 55.2 is really all about that dividend. How is it going to be treated? Well, if 55.2 applies, there are some negative consequences. The first one that's in 55.2a says, you know what? If this section applies to your transaction or series of transactions, that dividend that you thought was tax-free, sorry, it's going to be deemed not to be a dividend to the recipient. Furthermore, under 55.2c, it is going to be deemed a gain from a disposition of capital property, and it's going to be a capital gain instead of a dividend and taxable as a capital gain. So basically, we've converted a uh, tax-free dividend into a taxable capital gain. Now, hang on a sec. We have 55.2a and 55.2c. Why did I take out B? Well, let me explain that. Before I do, let's remember that Section 55.2 covers two different kinds of dividends. Number one, there's actual dividends, you know, cash dividends. I mean, stock dividends are also covered in this section, but let's keep it simple. If, you, if uh, the OPCO pays an actual dividend to the hold, code 55.2a says, well, it's not a dividend to the recipient, and, and 55.2c says it's a capital gain, as a matter of fact. But there's another kind of dividend also covered in Section 55.2, and that's deemed dividends. And that's what 55.2b is about. And deemed dividends occur in, you know, 84.3 type transactions. Now, you might not remember how 84.3 works, so let's just go through a little bit of a reminder in terms of how that section works. Both 84.3 and 55.2 are anti-avoidance rules. And they have an interesting interplay, at least in my and a nerdy tax mind they do. In fact, they call it the 84.3 to 55.2 round tripped. Now, Section 84.3 now, we're not talking about 55.2 anymore. Now we're talking about 
deemed dividends covered in 84.3 cover two situations. Let's say you own an operating company. And if that operating company acquires, redeems, or cancels shares that are held by you, all right, 84.3 can apply. If the hold co owns the op co, and if the op co acquires, redeems, or cancels shares by held by hold co, 84.3 might apply for you to you to this situation. Here's how it works. ARC stands for acquisition, redemption, or cancellation. So if the acquisition, redemption, cancellation price is a thousand, and the puck of those shares, the paid up capital is 100, that's going to give you a deemed dividend of $900. All right, what's happening here in 84.3 is what? Well, it's taking a, uh, what should normally be a capital transaction and a capital gain and converting it into a deemed dividend, almost the exact opposite of what 55.2 is doing. That's what they want in the first situation. All right, if you own the OPCO, then it should be a dividend because that dividend is going to be taxable in your hands. And if it was left as a capital gain, that, of course, might qualify for the capital gains exemption. You'd get that uh, tax free. But it's a little different on the other side. Because if the OPCO you know, acquires or redeems or cancels the shares, it, uh, it turns into a dividend. That dividend is potentially tax free as an intercorporate dividend. So really what happens here is they interpose section 552B into the middle. And it applies to deem the disp to deem the second situation, the $900 dividend in the hold co-op co-structure back into capital property by the amount that the acquisition redemption or cancellation price exceeds the puck. That might be a little bit confusing. Let me see if I can simplify it. 552B says if there was a deemed disposition of shares Deemed dispositions come from 84.3 transactions, right, when you redeemed, acquired, or canceled at a price that exceeded the puck. It takes the 84.3 deemed dividend and converts it back into capital gain. That's what 55.2b does. Look at it this way. 84.3 converts disposition of capital property to a deemed dividend. That's what it does. 55.2b does the opposite. It takes the proceeds of disposition of the share, the deemed dividend, and converts it into a capital gain. You know, that's why it's a round trip, so to speak. Why is that necessary? Because 84.3 applies to situations where you own the shares yourself, and you're the one that's going to get the uh, capital gain that they want to convert into a deemed dividend. They don't want to convert the uh, hold co opco into a deemed dividend because deemed dividends, or dividends rather, travel tax-free. So we have to convert that back into a capital gain. You know, it's kind of a bit of a crazy system, but that's how it works. So to sum it up, if 55.2 applies, the negative consequences are, if it's just a normal, uh, if it's just a normal dividend, it's deemed not to be a dividend to the recipient, and it's deemed to be a gain from disposition of capital property, that's A and C. Uh, B only applies to the 84.3 type transactions, where there's a redemption, acquisition, or a cancellation for a price above the puck. Right, and then uh, it's a deemed disposition of the share, i.e. a capital gain. Now section 55.2.1 explains the conditions that are needed for 55.2 to apply. Now this was changed in the April 2015 budget and we're going to get to some of those changes towards the end of the presentation. I'm going to talk about you know, the negative impact it's going to potentially have on us as we try to operate our companies in the most tax efficient way possible. But if we're trying to keep track of the actual section, section 55.2.1 tells us when section 55.2 applies. And there's really three provisions that make 55.2 uh, apply. The first one is, this is not even going to be of any relevance to you unless a dividend is received that's deductible under section 112.1 or 138.6. That's important. If you don't have two companies, if you don't have an opco hold co type arrangement or something similar, where dividends are traveling from one company to the other, right, and are deductible under Section 112, i.e., they are tax free, then 55.2 has nothing to say to you. The other provision that can make 55.2 apply, well, one says if the result test is met, results tests come from deemed dividends under Section 84.3, or if the purpose test is met, right, on an actual dividend, and we're going to get into 
what exactly the purpose test is. And then the other thing that can make it uh, make you fall into the 55-2 net is if you flunk the safe income on hand test. Because safe income is an important concept in 55-2 considerations. And if uh, you don't have that safe income, you flunk that test, then you can fall into 55-2 and um, the negative consequences are going uh, to apply. Okay. Now the bottom here says you need all three. But either purpose or result, you don't need both of those. But it's got to be deductible under Section 112. Either the result test or the purpose test must be met. And you have to flunk the safe uh, income on hand test. And if all three are there, bingo, you fall into the 55-2 net. And your, your dividend is going to be converted into a capital gain. Okay, now I'm not going to get too much into Section 112.1 or anything like that. But if Hold Co. and Opco are connected corporations, connected corporations votes in value of 10% or Hold Co. controls Opco. And if Hold Co. is receiving dividends from Opco deductible under 112.1 or 138.6, then that's what? 552.1a uh, um, describes to make Section 55 apply to you. In other words, if you don't have two companies here and you don't have deduct, uh, dividends deductible under 112.1, this is not of any concern to you. Now, what is the section 55 2.1b little i results test? Well, it says this. If Opco, and we know we just talked about this in 84.3, if Opco acquires, redeems, or cancels shares held by Holdco, and 84.3 applies, if the result is reduction in the portion of the capital gain that, but for the dividend, would have been realized on a disposition at fair market value of any share immediately before the, before the dividend was paid, bingo, the negative consequences are going to apply. All right. In other words, the fair market value um, of the share right, is dropping. That's really what that says. And it's a result because you've done this. You've redeemed it. 84.3 is, is the only thing that triggers this part. 84.3, the transaction is done. And if the result was uh, a reduction in that portion of FMV, then you're going to fall into, well, as long as you have the other two as well, that's going to put you in the net for Section 55.2 to apply. But remember, results test only applies to 84.3 transactions. What about the purpose test? All right, now we're not talking about a deemed dividend from a cancellation, redemption, or acquisition. We're talking about Opco chucking $900 up to Holdco, i.e. an actual dividend. Well, we have to ask ourselves, was one of the purposes of the dividend a reduction of capital gain or either a decrease in the fair market value of any share in the corporation or an increase of cost of property to uh, an increased cost of property to the dividend recipient. Any one of those three. If the purpose of this transaction for Opco to pay a dividend to Holdco was the reduction of a capital gain, was to decrease the fair market value of any share uh, in the corporation or to increase the cost of property to the dividend recipient, if so, 55-2 negative consequences are going to apply. As we're going to see when we sum up at the end, this is greatly broadening the purposes section of Section 55-2. The purpose test was pretty simple before. It's no longer simple. And the third one is the safe income on hand test is flunked. We need all three, but either purpose or result. I am going to talk more about safe income in a second. But remember, when we're talking about the purpose test, it only has to be one of the purposes. And of course, the great debate in the tax community is, all, is, is, is really that purpose does not mean result. And that's important to keep in mind. Right? Purpose does not mean result. In other words, if the result of you paying a dividend from up, up to hold co was a reduction of capital gain, was a decrease of fair market value of any share, and was an increase of cost of property of recipient, that doesn't automatically mean negative consequences of 55.2 are going to apply if they were not the purpose of the transaction. All right? 
So paying normal dividends, we have a purpose test. When we have an 84-3 uh, redemption, it's a results test. Now, the problem, a purpose test is subjective. For example, what if you're paying dividends from the OPCO up to the HOLDCO for the purposes of creditor proofing? What if those dividends were flowing up for purification because you want to take advantage of the lifetime capital gains exemption? What if you uh, dividended up to the hold code because you wanted to fund additional hold co investments? Well, CRA has taken a pretty strict line on this. CRA's opinion is only regular dividends that are established to distribute income are the only things that really won't trigger the purpose test. Everything else is all is really potentially fair game. That's a huge expansion of the purpose test. What about exceptions? Well, section 552.1 C little i, the safe income on hand section says, you know what? Even if section 552.1 A, i.e. Uh, deductible under 112 connected corporations applied, and if B applied, i.e. you flunked the results test if it was a 84-3 transaction, or you flunked the purpose test if it was a normal dividend, even if both of those are in play. You are okay if, if the dividend paid does not exceed the income contributing to the capital gain that would occur if the share sold for fair market value before the dividend was paid. In other words, if the dividend comes out of safe income, safe income of course is really, you know, in a very rough approximation, the retained earnings held in your company and not uh, distributed to shareholders. If, you're, if your dividend does not exceed safe income, then you're fine. You know, the 55-2 negative consequences are not going to apply. Okay? So that's, uh, that's important to keep in mind. Now, safe income has always been in the Act, but it hasn't been that important for reasons I'm going to talk about when we get to the exceptions. But basically, if the dividend isn't greater than the retained earnings not distributed, you know, you're okay. And Section 55-2 negative consequences are not going to apply. Now, there is another exception in Section 55-2. The 84-3 transa transaction occurs and the result test is masked, 55-2 would normally apply. But you're still going to be okay if no unrelated party is involved. This probably is the most important part of the changes that I created this little presentation to, uh, to summarize. And that is... This exception, that your transaction is okay if no unrelated party is involved, obviously the actual wording is much more complicated than that, but that's the basic idea. At one point, that applied to all of the transactions, even normal dividends, even if you flunked the purpose test. As long as there's no unrelated party involved, you still had an exemption. Well, one of the big changes to 55.2 was to take that away. Now the no unrelated party involved exemption only applies to 84.3 type transactions, right? If the result test is met, you're okay if no unrelated party is involved. But, you know, if you, if you meet the purpose test, right? In other words, you fall into the net because your purpose uh, was to decrease fair market value, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Even if no unrelated party is involved, that doesn't save you anymore when we're talking about the purpose test. All right, the unrelated part, no unrelated party involved saves you from the results test, but not does not save you from the purpose test. So let's summarize the changes to intercorporate dividends in section 55. You know, we're trying to keep this thing moving, but it is a fairly complicated uh, set, of, set of rules. Number one, the purpose test, as I just described, was expanded. The old 55-2 basically said, you know, if the dividend reduced the capital gain on a share before the dividend was paid in very rough language, right, you met the purpose test. But they added. Purpose test also includes if the transaction led to a significant reduction of the fair market value of any share in the corporation, or if it led to a significant increase in the cost of property to the recipient, then that's also going to, you know, sort of meet the purpose test. And then those negative consequences are going to apply. So added, the added part here, these two right here, are huge. All right, they're huge. Why? Well, 
pretty much every dividend reduces the fair market value of the share. But again, to reiterate, and I'm reiterating because it's important, yeah, every dividend reduces the fair market value of a share. I mean, it's just kind of naturally occurs. But let's not turn this into a result test. Just because the result of every dividend is to reduce the fair market value of a share is not the salient issue. The salient issue was what that one of the purposes of the of doing the transaction in the first place. Purpose is not result. Okay, so we got to be very careful we don't get carried away here and think, well, every dividend reduces the fair market value of the share, so then the purpose test is met in every dividend. No. That result might be net met, but that might not have been the purpose. The purpose might have been something else. The other second big one is the related party exemption is reduced, as I just described a, a few minutes ago. In the old 55-2, it was a very broad exemption. If no unrelated party was involved, we didn't have to worry about safe income. You know, we didn't have to worry about a lot of factors. What was added to 55-2 is to greatly limit the related party exemption to 84-3 type deemed dividend transactions. All right. Now we have to rely on the purpose test, i.e. one of the purposes wasn't uh, to decrease fair market value, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In other words, the related party exemption is greatly, greatly narrow. This is why safe income is now going to be such a headache uh, for tax practitioners and accountants because it's going to have to be tracked because that's going to be the big out, and that's number three. In the old 55-2, safe income was not as relevant because of the related party exemption. All right, So people didn't have to worry about safe income as much. What did they add to 55-2? Well, no safe income can be attributed to discretionary dividends. That's another problem. Safe income can only be applied to shares with a gain. Right? That's another problem. So really, there's it's a kind of a there's more restrictions on on uh, what safe income can be applied to, but safe income is now going to be sort of the big um, escape hatch for intercorporate dividends. Where before the big escape hatch was it was a related party, so we didn't need to worry about anything else. So safe income is definitely going to become more important. But you know what? It's very difficult to calculate. There is no sort of check-the-box way of calculating safe income. You know, it hinges on a lot of uh, administrative positions taken by CRA and other factors. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's not necessarily an easy thing to do. It involves a lot of calculations, and it's a cumulative number. So we have to take into consideration, um, basically, every single year, of the organization's history after 1971 anyway. So here, going forward, what's the what's the net net here? Well, number one, intercorporate dividends are no longer routine. If the dividends are used in planning that are paying dividend from one company to the other, they need careful scrutiny. Creditor proofing, purification, dividend streaming, all very iffy unless, unless safe income is available. And the other big issue here is we don't have the court tests now. We don't have jurisprudence. Um, it's a little bit uncertain exactly how this is all going to be interpreted uh, as cases make their way through court. In the past, um, intercorporate dividends were a huge part of tax planning in terms of moving money around. It's just not that easy anymore. And if you're in a situation where you're trying to make balloon dividend payments, from the opco to the hold co for any number of reasons, you know, that's going to be an iffy transaction. You most definitely need some tax advice. And you need to be very careful if you're trying to incorporate uh, intercorporate dividends in planning, right? That has to be carefully scrutinized. In the past, not so much. As long as no one related party was involved, you're okay. Not the case anymore. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this uh, presentation. Go below, give it a like. Subscribe to this channel. There is lots more coming. If you have ideas for videos that you'd like to see, uh, let me know what they are. I'm more than happy to prepare a video if I get a few people uh, requesting it. We're going to try to add this and build this over time. I'm trying with this channel to sort of take a middle ground. This pres these presentations are not for tax practitioners, right? but they're for business type people who have a little bit more interest in knowing the details and the underpinnings of what some of these tax rules are. So. Hopefully this video hit that sweet spot. And we'll see you next time.